and welcome everyone. My name is Vanessa Maydew. I am a communications and knowledge exchange specialist with supporting evidence-based interventions based at the University of Edinburgh. We convene the Livestock Data for Decisions Community of Practice, LD4D, um, which is a community of practice of the CGIR Big Data in Agriculture platform. And we've uh, brought you all here today for this exciting session. Um, on COVID-19 livestock and livelihoods, solutions for data-driven recovery. So a bit of background, um, as you all know, COVID-19 has had significant impacts on the livestock sector in low and middle income countries. Um, local lockdowns have impacted food productions, limited access to animal health services and medication, and curbed the movement of pastoralists. At the same time, there are signs that the pandemic may have had unexpected positive effects in some ways, potentially, for example, reducing the impacts of livestock on climate and natural resources. Um, it has also opened new opportunities for digital interventions. However, many of the impacts are yet to be quantified and a lot of the data driven responses and interventions are still emerging. So in today's session, uh, we're going to look at some of the data needs and innovations that can help the sector rebuild more equitably and sustainably. We've designed this session to build on the discussions of the recent multi-stakeholder uh, forum of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, GASL. Um, so let me introduce our panel. Um, Mark Mitchell is here with us today. He is the Director of Livestock and Dairy Programs for Land of Lakes Venture 37. With over 30 years of livestock work in his portfolio, Mark supports the Venture 37's projects, technical and design needs in livestock and animal source foods. Uh, we have Leila Amadou Aruna, and she's a cartography and database management expert for the Réseau Bilital Marobé, which is a RBM, and it's the network of pastoral organizations. And she's in charge of geographic information systems and database management, working on pastoral surveillance and early warning systems and she's joining us from uh, Niger. Her colleague is Cédric Bernard, and he's with the Regional Food Security and, sorry, he's a Regional Food Security and Livelihood Advisor with Action Against Hunger, Action Contre la Faim, and he's based in Dakar, Senegal, and his work supports a better understanding of agrarian dynamics and sustainable farming systems. Um, we also have Michael Graham, Mike, uh, he's a postdoctoral fellow in biogeochemical modeling and remote sensing at the International Livestock Research Institute, ILRI, and he's based with the Mazingira Center, assessing environmental and climate change dimensions of livestock systems. So welcome everyone. So our first presenter today is Mark Mitchell from Land of the Lakes Venture 37. Over to you. Hello, my name is Mark Mitchell and I serve as the Director of Livestock and Dairy at Land of Lakes Venture 37. I worked in the international development sector for over 20 years across Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and Africa. The impulse survey conducted by Venture 37 was completed during July 2020, and we started to present the results to partners the end of August 2020. A telephone interview process was used to collect the information as the country selected were either in restricted movement areas or our offices were operating remotely. It covered the animal source food value chain actors such as input suppliers and this included all the way from pharmaceuticals up through feed uh, and then farmers themselves, animal source food uh, processors, bankers, and consumers, and that was also across the four countries on three different continents as well. Because the, curve, the Pulse Survey was just that, we used other sources of data to support any conclusions that were bring, being drawn from the results that we had obtained. Uh, one example is the comparison of responses from consumers in the Impulse Survey to FAO's big data tool on food price changes during the same period. Another example was the survey information coming from other organizations in the sector that were being uh, uh, reported on. I think our V37 purpose was not only to record the effects of COVID-19, but to develop a strategy to offset those effects as well. Our private sector focus 
needed to close the loop to, to set a new course of action into motion. And today's question is, what did we find from the impulse survey that is impacting climate and resource use, as well as the livelihoods and the economic growth? The impulse survey supported some of the larger readouts where prices increased on concentrate feeds manufactured from grains for various reasons. The cost of the materials, uh, the raw materials to, uh, for the feed manufacturers themselves had increased. This was driven by transport costs and the associated restrictions on movements. Coming to the content of our discussion over uh, climate and resource use, forages stood out because only 3% of feed cost increases were associated with forages. Where forages did show cost increases, it was associated more with the cut and carry activities we see in a lot of countries. These countries, you know, include Bangladesh, and Bangladesh has problems such as climate change and effects on the salinity levels in the soils as a result. We have new forage varieties that are more salt tolerant, which allows farmers to adopt to climate change and make better use of their resources. And the opportunity here is the strongest part of this, the scale out of the forage market. We've, we've started to see this, we've seen it in Kenya, uh, in following our Bangladesh, India has a similar limiting factor associated with the availability of forages for its livestock which has translated into high production costs for smallholder farmers. Two new varieties of grass were introduced, a super napier and a, and a, a hybrid uh, sorghum, which increased the daily milk yield of cattle by 41% with no other management changes made. This is due to the nutrient rich content of the sorghum versus the common roadside grasses that farmers would typically um, be out cutting. And our promise for discovery is where we, we now see the true you know, effects of these public-private um, ventures, partnerships that are going on. Corteva AgriSciences, Land O'Lakes Venture 37, ourselves, Big Co Land O'Lakes, another uh, uh, partnership developed in Kenya, Ford Genetics International and the International Livestock Research Institute, the ORI, have forged a private sector driven alliance that will use data driven approaches to support smallholders to get the right types of forages into dairy animals to improve animal nutrition and human food security. Using data from in country and regional forage trials and testing, this alliance is committed to getting the forage link of the value chain correct. 2019 forced a change in consumer spending due to a loss of income for many reasons. This resulted in lower purchases of animal source food products, you know, meat, eggs, poultry, uh, beef, etc. As documented in other surveys, cash flow shortages and the challenge of staying in business is one of the reasons processors were unable to adapt uh, their products for this change. The effects this will have on child stunting and, and cognitive skills will be the subject of many studies. 33% did make changes in their access to markets via online platforms, such as mobile money to carry out transactions of deliveries and online sales. These changes allow processors to access cash flow, which in turn paid farmers for product, maintained jobs, and contributed to livelihoods, and economic growth. The increase in the digital platform use has gone through a major behavior change. The opportunity to benefit from this shift was recently reinforced by USAID. USAID will focus on the rapid changes associated with behavior change around digitization. During the AGRF or AGRF conference, Use of digital tools and new business models are a priority. And again, in the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock Conference, new technologies and digital tools are being used faster than would otherwise have been adopted. The digitalization of our food, service, food system is a promise for recovery, but it has digital needs, which brings us to our last point here. 
The aggregation of our animal source food and demand. The focus on supply side data has been the norm. We now need to get better at the demand side. One problem found in several countries, for example, when lockdowns occurred, people left their urban environs and traveled back to their home areas to be with their family in response to this shock. The new animal source food value added distribution system was not set up to respond to the physical movement of their markets. Yes, their market is Kigali, but the consumers in Kigali just went back to their home areas and your trucks can't drive on those roads and there's no cold chain. We need a new delivery systems which can integrate supply and demand needs in the animal source food market. This is a tall task when asking within the enabling environment. Many countries do not have address systems. Many of the small businesses are informal but I still need to know how to send you my product or where to buy products from you. And we both need a bank account. And because our animal source food sector specific requirements, we need to be able to find available cold chains throughout the value chain itself. Thank you for allowing me to present these opportunities to you today. Thank you very much, Mark. Now we're going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, we have Leila Amadou Aruna. Please begin, Leila. Bonjour, je, je m'appelle Leila Adamou. Je travaille pour le RBM, qui est un réseau des éleveurs et pasteurs d'Afrique. Je vais vous présenter le système de suivi pastoral. En avril 2020, Suite à la déclaration de pandémie COVID-19, les éleveurs et leurs organisations, en particulier le RBM, étaient inquiets de la situation du fait des difficultés qu'ils anticipaient. Difficultés liées à la fermeture des frontières, les réductions de mobilité à l'intérieur des pays, le peu de dispositifs mis en place pour suivre euh, les besoins du secteur et de ses acteurs et d'y apporter des réponses. Par ailleurs, ACF, Action contre la faim, commençait à recevoir des alertes de la part des relais de son réseau de surveillance. Il était alors important de mettre en place un système pour mieux suivre les impacts de la pandémie sur les pasteurs et agro-pasteurs. RBM et ACF se sont donc rapprochés en mutualisant leur savoir-faire. D'une part, un réseau d'éleveurs qui dispose d'une très bonne connaissance terrain et de l'autre part, une, org une ONG internationale disposant d'un savoir-faire sur les nouvelles technologies de l'information et de la communication. Avec pour objectif, tout d'abord, d'informer sur la situation des ménages pastoraux face à la pandémie et les mesures sanitaires de façon hebdomadaire à travers une plateforme d'analyse publique. D'identifier les zones géographiques impactées de prioriser les réponses à amener avec les communautés pastorales. La plateforme de visualisation est générée à partir des informations que remontent les relais des dispositifs de veille. Au total, plus de 350 relais repartis dans 10 pays contribuent de manière hebdomadaire à renseigner un total de 22 indicateurs. Parmi ces indicateurs, on peut citer la pénurie des dorés de base ainsi que leur prix, la fermeture des marchés, l'existence de campagnes de sensibilisation sur la COVID-19. Cette surveillance COVID vient en complément du système de veille pastorale établi par ACF et utilisant l'information satellitaire pour cartographier les anomalies de biomasse en relation avec la disponibilité en pâturage. Quels sont alors les challenges rencontrés pour la collecte des données? Les principaux défis rencontrés dans le cadre de la collecte des données sont assez nombreux. Il s'agit d'abord de la manière semi-automatisée de la collecte en induisant des risques d'erreur au niveau de l'opération manuelle de vérification et de filtrage des données de terrain 
Il y a aussi la conservation de la mobilisation des relais malgré les problèmes techniques et la fiabilité du réseau de communication. Nous avons aussi comme défi le respect de la périodicité des délais de la collecte des données et la mise à jour de la plateforme de visualisation. Et enfin, comme défi, on peut citer la dépendance du système du niveau d'information disponible et de la perception même des relais consultés, qui est un choix assumé car il permet de faire remonter la voix des acteurs du terrain. Quelles sont alors les pistes d'amélioration de ce système et quel avenir pour cet outil Alors, la volonté est de s'orienter vers un système de surveillance pastorale, au-delà du cadre de la pandémie, en incluant des indicateurs supplémentaires sur les maladies des animaux, la qualité animale et la disponibilité en pâturage. Le souhait est également d'élargir la couverture euh, géographique. Comme, euh, notamment au Tchad, au Nigeria, dans certaines régions du Mali, au Burkina Faso et de la Mauritanie. Et d'augmenter le nombre de relais car un maillage plus dense permettrait une meilleure euh, fiabilité. Nous avons aussi la redescente de l'information qui demeure un, acte, euh, un axe important de l'amélioration du système. Cela passe à la des analystes au niveau des pays pour la production de bulletins euh, spécifiquement pays et la diversification des supports de communication. On peut citer les radios locales sur le terrain, il y a les messages clés via WhatsApp et SMS. On a aussi l'amélioration de la collecte des données vers un système plus automatique et plus rapide que la collecte d'informations par téléphone. Il s'agit de l'utilisation systématique de Kobo, de ODK ou de Télérivette. Alors, qui sont, euh, qui sont les gens qui utilisent le dashboard et dans quel but? Le dashboard est utilisé par des organisations membres du RBM, qui sont des représentations des, éle des, des éleveurs. Le RBM et ACF utilisent également l'information pour illustrer les besoins d'appui et appuyer les demandes de financement. Le dashboard est aussi utilisé pour la prise de décision par de nombreux partenaires de ACF et de RBM. Il s'agit des gouvernements, les bailleurs de fonds, les organisations internationales et sous-régionales telles que SILS, CDAO, il y a aussi les organisations paysannes régionales. Il est en même temps là pour mettre en avant le secteur pastoral, afin de donner sa juste place et de la visibilité à ce secteur, un secteur innovant qui est adaptatif et résilient. Comment est-ce que le dashboard est utilisé pour appuyer, pour appuyer et aider pour la prise de décision au niveau local? C'est d'ailleurs un axe d'amélioration du système. Déjà, le dashboard et le, bull, et le bulletin sont permis de, ont permis de définir des actions d'appui aux pasteurs au niveau local. Il permet de déterminer où et quand intervenir avec des actions d'urgence. Et cela a suscité la mise au point de projets de grande envergure, parmi lesquels on peut citer le projet de PH2P, qui est un projet de résilience d'appui aux familles d'éleveurs confrontés aux effets cumulés, non seulement de la soudure pastorale, de l'insécurité, mais aussi de la pandémie liée à COVID-19. Enfin, le système permet de surveiller l'efficacité des campagnes de sensibilisation sur la COVID-19 au niveau local. En conclusion, je peux souligner que l'élaboration de cet outil a été pour ACF et RBM une occasion de mutualiser et partager leur savoir-faire sur les dispositifs de veille pastorale en Afrique de l'Ouest. Au-delà du dispositif lui-même, l'initiative est un vecteur pour le renforcement des capacités croisées entre les organisations et du poids des organisations de la société civile dans la gouvernance de la sécurité alimentaire et nutritionnelle en Afrique de l'Ouest. Sur ce, je vous remercie 
pour votre attention et je me tiens à votre disposition pour répondre à vos questions. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Leila. Merci beaucoup. Our next speaker is Mike Graham from Ilry. Over to you, Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Graham. I'm a postdoctoral scientist at ILRI. I'm specifically at the Mazengir Environmental Research Center within ILRI. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today about the environmental impact of COVID-19 in northern Kenya specifically and looking at some uh, kind of unique data sources to do that. Uh, so just to give some brief background on this. So uh, livestock are the primary source of greenhouse gas emissions uh, from agriculture in Eastern Africa. And these are greenhouse gas emissions are often from livestock are often going to be affected by shock events like drought. So for example, you could have a drought that uh, where you have a major loss from the total herd and that reduces the number of animals and that reduces the amount of greenhouse gas emissions coming from the system. Uh, these pastoralist systems are also quite dependent on movement for seasonal access to resources such as grazing and water resources. Uh, in Kenya, uh, as a result of COVID-19, there have been restrictions on movements and also there have been market closures. Uh, so this could have some impacts on greenhouse gas emissions indirectly, potentially. Um, but to this point, there haven't really been any assessments done on changes in greenhouse gas emissions from livestock due to COVID-19. Uh, so we kind of wanted to look at this. So we basically have a framework for how we want to look at what are the greenhouse gas emissions coming from livestock in general. Uh, so there's three main ways we look at this. One is to look at herd size. The other two are feed availability and livestock movement. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on herd size uh, just for the interest of time. And if herd size is actually an interesting thing to look at and kind of has some uncertainty with it. So I think it'll be a good discussion. Uh, but generally speaking, if you have a larger herd, that means you have more animals and higher greenhouse gas emissions in total. On the other hand, a smaller herd, you have a lot of the opposite. You have fewer animals emitting fewer greenhouse gases. So basically, we're going to look at herd size today and look at what the effects of COVID have been on herd size. Uh, and in terms of doing that, we can't really do that directly right now. So we're going to use some proxy data. Uh, so we actually have crowdsourced data from 10 major regional markets in northern Kenya, uh, going from November 2019 through September 2020. And then we also have some longitudinal household surveys in Samburu County in northern Kenya. And we have those for multiple points in 2019 and 2020 that we can kind of do a comparison with. So looking at the results on herd size. So this is on your right, you sh are showing the average uh, cattle volume in these major markets in Northern Kenya over time, starting in November, you can see that following the closure of markets that uh, there is a really big drop in the number of animals passing through the market. Uh, that kind of goes back up when the markets reopen, as you might expect, but it's never really as high as it was prior to the start of the pandemic. So taken on its own, it would seem like, well, there's fewer animals going through the market, and maybe that means that there's an increase in herd size, or at least herd size is staying the same. Uh, but if we look at the household data, uh, so this is again looking at cattle and comparing 2019 and 2020, we see that from the initial herd size in 2019 versus 2020, there was a much larger increase, um, I'm sorry, a much larger decrease in the herd size between years. And this was actually even bigger for other animals. This is just showing cattle. Uh, so we had an even bigger increase, a bigger decrease in herd size potentially in small household in these household surveys for sheep and camels as well. So there could be a decrease in herd size according to the household data. So we have kind of some contrasting stories coming out of these two different data sets about what's going on with herd size. So we wanted to go into a little more detail here. So uh, one thing that could be happening based on what we're seeing in the market data is that we might be seeing even though these are, so these markets are large legal formal markets and we might be seeing what might be happening is that there might be, and the data kind of indicates this, is that there's some increase in activity in informal markets. So these, there could be 
increases in sales and slaughter of livestock that are occurring mainly now through informal channels. Um, looking more closely at the household data, we can see that all transactions are up in 2020 compared to 2019, including purchases, but slaughter and sales are up by considerably more. Uh, and this is looking at household data. So again, you could be having something here where uh, the market data isn't really capturing uh, some of the things that are happening at the household level. So one thing that could be happening if based on this data is we could be seeing, for example, a so the households that we looked at are in the bottom half of the percentile by wealth. So something that could be happening here is that households are slaughtering animals for their own consumption to meet their immediate needs, or maybe they're uh, exchanging animals between households. And that would also be occurring off the record and again, wouldn't be picked up in the market data. So um, some conclusions here that we might draw from this are one that herd size is probably decreasing if we're accounting for these uh, transactions that are occurring through informal channels and within and between households. So herd size is likely decreased in northern Kenya due to COVID-19 and the uh, that would almost certainly result in a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions from livestock due to COVID-19 if we have a reduction in herd size. However, many of these transactions are that we're seeing uh, the reduction in herd size is kind of occurring off the books through informal markets or within and between households. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty here. We really need more data on informal markets and how much livestock are passing through there and how much of this activity is occurring within and between households. Uh, and also in general, we need more accurate estimates of the total herd size in the region. And that's kind of something that's notoriously difficult to get even under normal circumstances because pastoralists are not generally uh, forthcoming with information about their uh, the number of animals they own. So it can be difficult to get accurate information on what the herd, is like, herd size is to begin with. So all these kind of add a bit of uncertainty and we're trying to look a little more closely in the future on what's going on with some of these things. Uh, but the overall picture looks like we may have seen some reductions in herd size and that could have a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I think that's all I have for you today. So thank, I would just say thank you very much for allowing me to speak today and it was great being here. So thank you all very much for these very interesting presentations. Uh, we've seen quite a variety of data-driven approaches to try to assess what's going on uh, in pastoral communities with the dashboard, the Sig Sahel dashboard. We're looking at uh, animal source food, which obviously impacts food security and uh, economy, and also the climate change and natural resource dynamics that the, the pandemic has brought about in areas of Kenya. So I'll start with a few uh, specific follow-ups. Um, the first question is for you, Mark. Uh, you mentioned some data-driven approaches about identifying the right type of forages. And I wonder if you can expand on how you're doing that. The information that we, we previously started on the activities for the forages prior to the pandemic. We had identified that process and started on both identifying the forages that ha already had breeding. We already had previous data. For example, I mentioned the study out of, out of India, and I think Gilry uh, conducted that research. So we have a lot of data that supports our need to really bring on the, the forage activities. And so as, as we go through that now, what we're looking for is what forages specifically lower the cost and improve the quality and quantity of animal source foods. And, and that private sector partnership that's been formed will be the basis of uh, that introduction. And that, that will probably start in Kenya immediately. So we're, we're taking the data and we're taking action instantly. Thanks a lot. Um, so the next question is from Mike. Uh, I wonder also about um, the way that you gathered your data and that's, you mentioned crowdsourcing and I just wonder if you can elaborate a little bit more on, on what you meant by that and how that was done. 
Sure. So um, the data that we have from the formal markets in northern Kenya, so we have um, basically that we have traders or other intermediaries who are in the market and they have access to cell phones. And basically, I think I am not the person who is in charge of this, so I hope I am answering this correctly, but it basically is a system where we give some small payment for um, responses for people in those markets to give us information on estimates of, for example, how much, how many animals are passing through of each species, uh, what conditions are like in the market in general, et cetera. So it kind of works with, uh, there's a very small payment and incentive for uh, giving the data and also providing high quality data. So there is some financial incentive involved to try and make that work. Thank you. And you mentioned that that, that works well in formal markets. But um, I noticed, I mean, uh, quite a lot of the livestock sector is actually in informal markets. And um, we're just, I think this is a question for everyone about the challenges of accessing data from informal market and how, how much that is a barrier to really, you know, being able to do really accurate work. Um, and if you have ideas on overcoming that. So I wonder if I can actually put that first to um, Cedric and Leila on, on the challenges around gathering data from informal markets, because so much of the pastoral sector is obviously informal and how you're overcoming that a bit. Okay, donc je, je vais tenter de répondre à la question. C'est donc de savoir si, quels sont les types de marchés qui, en fait, cette question là concernant les marchés formels et informels, il faut savoir qu'au niveau local, ce sont des marchés qui sont hebdomadaires et ce sont des marchés à bétail. Pour chaque village, on a un marché. Donc, le plus souvent, euh, ce sont ces marchés-là qu'on suit. Voilà. Ce sont les marchés à bétail qui sont suivis et ce sont des marchés qui sont hebdomadaires pour chaque village, par exemple. OK. Je ne so, sais pas si je reprends yeah. à la question. Non, this is fine. Um, so basically for Western Africa, um, the, 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 the geographic area our system cover, um, most of the markets are quite formal. They are all officials, the local authorities are involved in it. Um, they, they take place every week. Um, and, um, and so our system relies on um, um, pastors and agro-pastors that are um, in situ living there no and and they're the one collecting the information and passing it over to the system um as Leila was showing in her presentation and i'm adding this on top of what Leila was saying um one of the difficulty we have is to actually be able to um quality control um the prices that are um um putting in the system there is uh, the basic for our system is that the, the people are trained um, and people understand the objective of it. And after that, the, the data that they collect on the local markets are um, um, through a rapid quality check by the conversation on the phone are just uploaded into the, the database that we are using. Thanks, Cedric. Um, Mike or Mark, do you want to briefly touch on how you deal with the uh, data gaps that you know you might encounter around informal markets? I'll just quickly say that we we look for the secondary sources of data to support any of the processes. Uh, for example, if, if we know that we have a certain volume going through the formal markets, we know that all these cattle and sheep and goats didn't disappear. They're still there. And so as we go around, then we, we backtrack and triangulate to say, hey, here's another data set that tries to support these numbers. Great. Mike, do you want to add anything? Uh, I know you mentioned that, uh, you know, you're, you're dealing with um, estimates of herd size. And there was a question on, on how, how can you assume that herd size decreased without the data from informal markets? Right. So we're kind of similar to what Mark said. It's, it's kind of inferential in terms of we have a complementary data set where we're looking at household data instead of market data, where we're seeing these 
fairly significant losses through sales and slaughter. And we're kind of inferring from that that, well, we're not seeing it come up in the formal markets. So it's occurring. So it must either be within the household or it's occurring through informal channels. And it's kind of all very inferential right now because we don't have any direct, it's hard to get anything direct on evidence on that in terms of the crowdsource data we are trying to get our people in the that are crowdsourcing that data we're asking more questions about uh, what is happening with formal markets which we hadn't really been doing before but there is some evidence now that of we're us trying to look at well how much is actually going through over informal markets or what percentage of the formal markets are actually operational so we're trying to get a bit more data on it but it's imperfect great thank you mike Okay, um, the next question is back to Leila and Cedric. Um, so it seems from what you presented that the dashboard is fulfilling a need that may have existed even before the pandemic. Uh, and is that correct? And what application does this dashboard have beyond the current pandemic? How do you think it can contribute to longer term, uh, sorry, longer term understanding in the pastoral sector? Donc, uh... Effectivement, euh, le dashboard a été développé dans le cadre du suivi de l'impact de, de la COVID-19 sur les ressources pastorales euh, de, la, de nos zones d'activité. Mais il y avait effectivement ce besoin-là. C'est une plateforme qui peut être utilisée pour autre chose. Donc, déjà, avant, il y avait un suivi qui se faisait, un suivi de, des ressources pastorales. Mais là, Après ce, cette situation de pandémie COVID-19, on va continuer et faire et développer d'autres indicateurs. Voilà, donc pendant la présentation, j'avais parlé des indicateurs sur les maladies des animaux. On va les faire paraître sur, la, sur le dashboard. On va parler aussi de la disponibilité en pâturage. Ce sont des indicateurs sur lesquels on est en train de discuter actuellement. Pour, pour les faire paraître sur le dashboard. Voilà. Donc, euh, il y aura une suite, effectivement. Si tout va okay. bien. <laughs> oui. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to translate and then maybe um, add a few information. So, yes, um, there was a need before the pandemic. What, um, and there were existing systems. Um, Action Against Hunger is running their own system. The LBM is running their own system. Uh, there are bridges between the two systems, but we had nothing at that scale um, in common. And, and the need for information in the COVID-19 pandemic context um, gave us a push kind of to work together and set that dashboard up. So yes, there was a need before, um, but the opportunity created um, the dynamic, let's say, to, to create the tool. Um, and um, as Leila presented, uh, yes, we intend to maintain uh, this dashboard and make it evolve um, using other indicators that are currently used in our um, other early warning system. Um, and she's mentioning um, the three indicators um, um, on um, an animal diseases, availability of um, um, pasture, Availability, yeah, and, and mortality. So those are the three indicators that will um, appear in the dashboard or we hope to integrate in the dashboard in the future. Um, the idea is, uh, and now I'm adding on top of that, um, we are aiming at having longer series of data um, to be able to actually monitor uh, bigger trends and, and have more information on how, uh, at, um, how is the situation evolving. And we are also hoping to be able to use those data that are uh, gathered to inform the dashboard um, um, with, in addition to all the satellite surveillance system we've got um, on um, biomass, biomass anomalies and, and so on to better contextualize what we observe at local level with every single um, data collector. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Uh, that's, that's, really, that's really interesting. So, you know, we're hearing an example of how the pandemic catalyzed a new way of working, a new collaboration, a new tool. So on that theme, uh, for 
both Mike and Mark has this situation that, you know, that we've been all going through in different ways, change the way that you work in any positive ways? Um, and will you continue to work in those new ways moving forward? Uh, perhaps Mike first. Sure, so I can't speak to too much to the data on the ground, uh, but this is, it's definitely become a, usually what we have is field experiments and uh, laboratory experiments. And all that has kind of been put on hold as a result of the pandemic. So that's been very difficult. So one of the nice things that's come about is the data you're seeing is I'm a modeling biogeochemical person and the data sources we're working with are mostly through people who are in the economics or some other, or some social sciences field. And we're seeing more collaboration between those fields within ILRI to try and kind of wrap our heads around what exactly is going on. So I think we're seeing some increased collaboration just within the teams that we have in, in house, I guess, uh, to try and get a better idea and an understanding of what's going on. That's, that's really interesting to hear. Uh, what about you, Mark? Um, so for our activities, the delivery, you know, the final process of getting animal source foods uh, to consumers has been the biggest change. The, the use of the digital platforms, whether it's the online sales, et cetera, that I referenced in the presentation has been a big change. We already see those changes taking place, for example, in the input supply sector, at, uh, Africa as much as anywhere. And so we're, we're taking another step further. We're, we're looking, there was a side effect on food safety uh, for everyone, even though we, we have documentation that shows that the, the coronavirus does not transmit via food. And so, but consumer perception is yes, it can. And so it's given us an opportunity to address more of the One Health issues so that as we look more at say an outgrower who's growing poultry for a processor. They have a, a sale app now that we're finalizing in, in um, uh, back in to Bangladesh actually. And so we're, we're trying to track all the aspects of the value chain all the way through so that we ensure the food safety, we give the consumers confidence in what they're after. And then all of those trade platforms, as I said in the presentation, we still have a bit of a weak link on how to incorporate the transportation needs for all these products. So we're, we're still chasing that one a little bit. And, and that's where I leave the challenge to the, to the global data needs. Thank you. That's great. So we only have a few minutes left. I'm going to ask a final question and try to get everyone's response. Um, so of the approaches that you've seen presented today, uh, do you see any potential to apply some of these tools or approaches in the areas where you work to improve the knowledge base? So perhaps everyone can go around and just say like, what's the one thing that you would really be interested in potentially following up on or finding out more about? Uh, in the, as a next step. So um, I'll start with Leila and Cedric. Yeah, je pense que ça, je vais te laisser, uh, je vais te okay. laisser répondre. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> Mais moi, j'ai trouvé toutes les présentations quand même très intéressantes, seulement uh, c'était en anglais. Donc yeah. uh, du coup, uh, les idées ne me parvenaient pas entièrement en fait. Donc, okay, fine. Voilà, so, donc yeah. voilà un peu, j'étais un peu pénalisée, mais ça va. Thank you. Voilà. Leila. So, oui. Leila wants to thank you all. Um, just, just sharing, um, saying that she could follow the presentations, but the English language made it difficult for her to jump on every single idea. And, and so, yeah, identifying the possibilities for bridges between what the different speakers have. Um, um, mentioned is, is a bit um, tricky at this stage, but I thought she enjoyed the, the different presentation. I, would, um, I think, um, well, we, we in Western Africa um, um, face a, a lot of issues related to the, the, the photo quality. Um, most of the biomass that is growing in the area, we, we can follow the biomass, but we don't know much about its, um, or the French word for it is appetability. So how 
the animal react to it today? Is it, is it a biomass that is actually um, um, contributing to um, um, animal health and, 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 and better um, production for access to market? This is something that is kind of a black spot for now, and I think it could be interesting to follow up on that. Uh, from Mike's uh, presentation, I think we uh, there are many links uh, potentially, and all the approach to um, the, the the market and the different proxies that are used for herd um, size sizes are very interesting. We we have the same difficulties um, um, trying to approach an estimation of how many animals we've got in the area, and so we have the availability of biomass, the apparent availability, but we don't know on the other side how many animals and um, are, are in the geographic area of interest. So I think those are directions we could um, probably explore together uh, in the future. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. That's really great. No, thanks. That, that's, that's a really great connection. Um, so uh, Mark, do you, maybe just in a minute, can you reflect sure. on, on those kinds of bridges and connections from your, from your standpoint? So the, the dashboard immediately caught my attention, uh, even in our pre-read materials. I went straight to the website and looked through it. I I found that, let's take, for example, if I'm a buyer and all of a sudden I have a large contract to uh, supply of, you know, say 20,000 tons of meat, and I've got 30 days to put it in a container and ship it somewhere. And if I can go to a dashboard that quickly tells me where the highest concentration of, of the cattle that I'm looking for are, it, it saves me, you know, say 30 phone calls. So also think through the final demand side needs and how do we track and, and provide market access using a dashboard like that. Great. And uh, the final word goes to Mike. Final thoughts on, uh, you know, potential avenues for, for yourself, for your work? Yeah, so I definitely saw a lot of overlap with what Leila and Cedric are working on uh, with the focus on the markets. And uh, part of what I didn't get into was uh, the feed availability aspect, which is we're also, we also have uh, remote sensing data where we're looking at NDVI over time, similar to what you're looking at with uh, biomass. So I'm guessing we're kind of using the same metrics there. So there's a lot of overlap in terms of what the things we're looking at is. But I think the big question remains what's going on with the informal markets and how can you, when we get more data on that and maybe more household data or some other form of data to try and figure out what's happening off the market, essentially. Wonderful. So, uh, you know, I'm very pleased that you all sort of saw, you know, bridges and interesting connections between your work. I think you're all working on different dimensions of what is essentially the same problem. You know, how do we ensure a resilient and sustainable livestock sector that brings about food security that, you know, benefits, uh, especially the most vulnerable people in the world. So, um, you know, all of this work is extremely relevant. And, and I just want to thank you all so much for your time. I know a lot of uh, preparation has got into it. So, Thanks again, and thank you for being part of the Big Data in Agriculture convention.